It's cold out there in the Oort Cloud, but someday it could be the place where we keep the home fires burning for humanity. Today we'll be talking about how to colonize our solar systems Oort Cloud and Kuiper Belt, two fairly distinct regions of space but with a good deal of overlap into how they would be colonized. However we should start by talking briefly about how planets form and what a planet is first. The basics are simple enough, some region of space is thick with gas and something, like the shockwave of a supernova, comes by and causes it to start being less evenly distributed. Bits will emerge that compact into objects and have enough mass to suck in more material, but this often results in a protoplanetary disk. Momentum, angular or regular, has to be conserved, so you end up with a disk of material all spinning in one direction, and a star forms at its center and others clump to become planets. Clumps of matter on the same orbit of this disk tend to combine. There are accepted rules for what qualifies as a planet. The first rule is that the object must orbit a star, otherwise it's not a planet, it's a moon. The second is that it needs to have enough mass to be basically a sphere shape, otherwise a soda can orbiting the sun would qualify as a planet. And the third is that it should have cleared the region it orbits through. This third rule for what makes a planet is the one that demoted Pluto to dwarf planet status. Pluto is a bit more massive than the entire asteroid belt that orbits the Sun between Mars and Jupiter, but the Kuiper Belt, out past Neptune, is a lot more massive than the asteroid belt. Any solar system might have an asteroid belt or even multiple ones, but odds are most have a Kuiper Belt, some region on the edge of the main protoplanetary disk that was too spread out to form a planet, it's like the foam at the edge of a whirlpool. Pluto is a Kuiper Belt object itself, part of why it was demoted from full planet status. The region out past Neptune is full of icy bodies, many of which would make respectable moons, that we variously call trans-Neptunian objects, plutonoids, Kuiper Belt objects, or scattered disk objects. We don't know their combined mass with accuracy, but this region from 30 to 50 AU is estimated to be 20 to 200 times more massive than the asteroid belt. We often talk about how handy the belt will be for space colonization, and this second belt is as well. Out past that is a more hypothetical region called the Oort Cloud, which probably has two segments, one inner one that is somewhat disc-like, sometimes called the Hills Cloud, and the outer region is spherical. Now we often call the Oort Cloud theoretical, but there's no doubt that region of space exists and has lots of tiny icy bodies, just the exact extent and nature of it is in doubt. It's very hard to see a Kuiper Belt object, and they are far closer to the Earth and the Sun than Oort objects. Two identical objects, one ten times further from Earth and the Sun, are vastly different in their detectability. Being ten times further from us, we see only ten squared or one hundredth the light its closer twin gives off. At the same time, it's ten times further from the Sun, and only gets ten squared or one hundredth the light its closer twin gets. So on Earth the closer one appears 10,000 times brighter, and only our best equipment can see all but the largest Kuiper Belt objects. The Oort Cloud is not 10 times further away than the Kuiper Belt, it's more like a thousand, so objects out there appear a trillion times dimmer than their twins in the Kuiper Belt. For that reason, we don't have much data on the objects out there by direct imaging, so we know there's plenty but can't speak with much certainty and have to limit it to theory and models for now. As an example, a clone of Earth and the Sun off at 1 million AU, about 16 light years, would be a trillionth as bright too, because it's just far away from us, not its Sun. Needless to say, we have a lot of difficulty seeing such an object, but we know where to look. The volume of space near a Sun, where you'd find planets, is about a billionth the volume an Oort Cloud would occupy. On top of that, while we theorize the mass of the Oort Cloud to be several times that of Earth, albeit with huge margins of error, the objects in it will tend to be a lot smaller than a planet. Of course you can have planets out in the Oort Cloud too, wandering ejected ones or ones in such a loose orbit that they barely know the Sun is there, and we call these rogue planets, nomad planets, or steppenwolf planets. 
We discussed the possibility of life developing on these way back in the Vogue Planets episode, and we briefly touched on settling them there too. The basic upshot though is that the Kuiper Belt, Oort Disk, and Oort Cloud probably are swimming in tiny icy bodies of potential value to us, many of which might have some rocky material in them too. To colonize any of these objects one has to abandon solar or fission power as classic options, in favor of fusion, the fuel for which they have plenty of. There's two caveats on that. You might find some fissile materials out there and you can export them, and so too, while a solar panel won't work for direct sunlight, lasers on solar satellites nearer the sun can beam energy out to panels. I'd always rather have my power plants on hand, not so far off it might take a month just for a message to reach them, but orbits are predictable things and keeping a laser on station out in the Oort wouldn't be that hard. Lasers do spread out over distance so it would arrive less as a tight beam and more like a diffuse flashlight, and of course we might prefer microwaves over visible light, a maser, but there's nothing too sophisticated or complex about supplying power this way. I always like to stress the importance of fusion to humanity's future in space, but I also always like to make it clear that with a bit more hassle we can do most of the same things by using the natural fusion reactor that is our sun. Normally when we start discussing these icy bodies for colonization it is in the context of dragging them inwards to terraform Mars or Venus. But as we've seen in this series, that classic image of colonizing the solar system by terraforming the planets in it is seriously underutilizing those resources. We call those objects far out past Neptune icy bodies, but ice in this case is not just water but methane, carbon, and ammonia as well, and such objects will have rocky material in their centers or spread out in an ice and gravel fashion, like on the side of a road that just got plowed for snow. These other ices along with regular water ice are known as volatiles, and they contain a lot of materials we need for life, particularly ones that are not very abundant in the warmer inner solar system. That's why folks want to bring them in. The thing is, while the Kuiper Belt objects are perfect for that, the Oort Cloud really is not. It could take centuries to move such an object inwards in a fashion that wouldn't burn up far more energy than it's worth. The Kuiper Belt also contains more than enough ices for terraforming all the planets and making a lot of habitats. Now if you want to go full on Dyson Swarm you need a lot more and the Oort Cloud probably has a lot more, but even if it has dozens of times the entire mass of Earth in these, it's still a lot less than the Sun has. We talked about extracting resources from the Sun via star lifting in the star lifting and Dyson Swarm episodes, and we'll discuss it a bit more in the next episode of the series, Colonizing the Sun. We can't be sure we can ever get such a process working, but it requires no new physics and again is our topic for next time. Assume for the moment you do get that working, and you do have fusion, and you've started mining the Sun because you've already run low on materials in the inner system out to and including the Kuiper Belt. At that point the Oort Cloud no longer looks like a great place to bring material in from. That's why this episode is titled Colonizing the Oort Cloud rather than the Kuiper Belt. I'm sure we'll colonize bits of the Kuiper Belt, sometimes just temporarily, and again the colonization method is almost identical to the Oort Cloud. However it's close enough to us, and easy enough to mine from the lack of gravity, that I would tend to expect us to bring the material in to use in settlements more often than settling way out there. However the Oort Cloud is even more way out there, and while it probably contains far more resources, it's nothing compared to what the Sun itself has. So leaving those out there, especially if you can use them for something out there, seems like a probable scenario for the future of the solar system. Now settling one is actually trivially easy, if you can get out there and have a power supply sufficient to live without the Sun, which you do if you can get out there and slow down to land on one. If you can get people out to these icy bodies, you can colonize them. The easiest method parallels how we do asteroids. You land, which due to your low gravity is more like parking at a space station, find a low spot or crater, and dig or melt your way in, using the material you extracted to fill over the top, like an anthill. Inside that you can build a rotating habitat, or more likely just insert the one you and the colonists came in, which can later be expanded. 
Indeed, as with asteroids, since there is so little gravity in the way, you can always expand your habitat, or chain of habitats, to be far larger than the original object since you can pile all the material you are not using around you in a shell. Thus you could start with an irregular shaped comet a dozen kilometers wide, and end with a nice polished icy shell the size of a decent moon full of habitats. Such shells give nice protection from cosmic radiation and meteorite strikes too. Of course the big question is why would you do this? There are a lot of these icy bodies but they are spread far apart. Your nearest neighbor might be further from you than Earth is from Pluto, and signals back and forth with Earth could take many weeks or even months. The edge of the Oort Cloud is about a light year away after all. What would a colony out there be doing? Why did they go there? What do they trade in, if anything? What purpose does such a colony serve? At first it would seem like none. If the material they had was particularly valuable back in the solar system, we wouldn't colonize these objects. At most we'd set up a small and minimally manned outpost to do maintenance on the engine moving it back into the solar system. That's a point to stress too. One shouldn't think of the Oort Cloud as part of the solar system, any more than a farm 50 miles from Chicago is part of Chicago, city or suburbs, just because it happens to be closer to Chicago than Milwaukee. If it is even nominally involved with the city, it will be because it has roads and highways there and is inside its economic sphere. Remember that bit about highways as it will come up again in a bit. Again though, it wouldn't seem like a colony in the Oort Cloud could serve a purpose. Stations out there can't serve as waypoints to other solar systems for instance, as odds are very few of the objects are on a roughly straight line to another neighboring star. And more importantly, interstellar ships do not stop en route to refuel or let passengers off to stretch their legs. A ship gets up to speed and coasts in interstellar space, it doesn't burn any fuel while coasting except for life support, and that life support doesn't cost much energy, for a ship or a habitat. Oh it's a lot of power compared to your electric bill, especially if you're providing artificial sunlight for farms or parks, but it is tiny compared to the energy needed to move a ship at any reasonable interstellar speed. It takes a lot more energy to get a ship up to 10% of light speed than a simple calculation of its kinetic energy would imply, but at a minimum you'd expect to need at least 10 to the 18th joules of energy per ton of vessel, and even if we assumed each person only needed 3 tons of ship cargo for the destination, and material for hydroponics, living room, and so on, and the trip would take a century, or about 3 billion seconds, that's still an average power supply of a gigawatt per person. That's about a million times what a household tends to use, and still a very low estimate for the total energy usage to move that ship. It's also enough power to light up an entire square kilometer of land at perpetual noontime lighting, which is way more space than anything but a hunter-gatherer civilization would need per person. 10 to 100 kilowatts per person for all life support, even with onboard parks and gardens, is more likely, and even using the high-end figure there and the low-end for energy to move the ship, you still have a life support system using just 1% of 1% of the ship's energy budget. Go faster and you need more energy for speed and less for life support, shorter trip. The only reason an interstellar ship can't have everybody living in their own cabin in the woods is all the mass needed for that dirt and forest, the power needs are a non-issue. A space station or rotating habitat way out in the Oort Cloud doesn't have that issue and isn't moving things. Now neither does a habitat in the inner solar system, but the point is in a fusion economy living space is only an issue because you have to build it and invest the mass to make it. One kilogram of fusion fuel, even with fairly extravagant individual power usage and inefficient equipment, can support a person's life support needs for a century. So even if you can only use deuterium for fusion, the easiest fusion option, as opposed to regular hydrogen, your typical comet-like body, a few kilometers in radius, is going to have a megaton or more of it, enough to support one person for a hundred billion years, or a hundred thousand people for a million years. And you can boost that to ten billion years, the lifetime of the sun, if you can use regular hydrogen even longer if you have higher fusion that can step hydrogen up to heavier elements than helium or have feedable Kugelblitz black holes. 
And we are talking about colonizing the Oort Cloud, something that should be at least many centuries off for anything but a few prototypes, so assuming some higher tech is probably okay. So again, living out there is no problem, any random comet could become a major metropolis that mostly needed no imports or exports. Again though, the question is why? On the one hand, it is a lot closer than any stars, so if you just want a place to send people who want their own private nation, or people who want to get away from whatever power or group of powers control the solar system, the Oort Cloud is a good place. But even then, it's not too much harder or time consuming to get to another solar system than an Oort object and then you've got an entire solar system, not just one comet. Of course those solar systems are probably claimed by someone, and if you want a small country of maybe a few million, arguing claims with some group that plans to colonize another solar system to eventually support quadrillions of people is probably not worth the effort. A few of the potential drivers for colonizing the Oort Cloud could be instability in the solar system, be it from war or disaster. These disasters could be artificial or natural. Natural ones include a close encounter with a rogue Jupiter, star or star remnant disrupting the planets and flinging them out of the system. Another natural one could ultimately be the sun getting hotter and brighter as it ages, causing the inner solar system to become inhospitable. As to artificial disasters, the Oort Cloud might also be used in an attempt to hide from an aggressive domestic or alien civilization. That is their one really valuable and unique feature, isolation and safety. Even in an emerging interstellar empire, our topic for next week, where every large rock in a solar system and every solar system for hundreds of light years around might be colonized and the rights to it fiercely contested if it's not, it's very unlikely anyone is dispatching armadas to go claim a single mountain-sized chunk of ice and gravel trillions of kilometers from the nearest sun, and many billions of kilometers from even its nearest neighboring icebergs in space. In many ways, you are more isolated out there than some colony 10,000 light years away would be because over time those places would all develop and grow in population. There's always folks for whom being far away from civilization is a plus, not a minus, and if you want to stay that way, picking prime real estate isn't the best option. If your goal is to have a civilization far from anybody else, claiming a distant fertile valley hundreds of miles from that civilization out there in the wilderness just ensures maybe a few generations before new neighbors arrive near you, and a distant solar system is likely to be the same. Worse too, because if you leave on some Ark ship for a several thousand year journey to build your own distant utopia, there's a good chance faster and better ships will have arrived in the meantime, constructed centuries later by folks who probably don't know or care you claimed the system already, and certainly won't care if they settle the one next to it and you complain you didn't want neighbors. In an expanding and growing civilization, if you want lots of space to yourself for generations worth of time, you either need to be willing to pack up every so often or pick a place people don't really want. A random Oort object probably qualifies. Of course that other option is viable too. Any such colony is basically a spaceship sitting inside a mountain of spaceship fuel, so if the neighborhood gets crowded or uncomfortable, you just build an engine, or turn it on if you still have the one you use to get there, and head off on a nomadic journey. It is an interesting dynamic we'll talk about more next week. On the one hand, interplanetary and stellar empires are likely to be far more immense and populous than science fiction tends to portray them, because people don't just colonize planets and should be hard to manage as a homogenous unit. On the other hand, what allows such populations is that independence of actual planets, because people are living in habitats that can be easily turned into spaceships. So it's more like an RV than a house or farm, you can just pick up and leave if you don't like the neighborhood which could have the strange byproduct of having space city habitats just pack up and leave whatever empire they belong to or move into another. But surely we can do better than just isolation as a motive for living there though. It's probably enough. Isolated farmsteads typically are more about the isolation than the farming, which is just about getting enough revenue to buy what you need and can't make, and these are fairly self-sufficient colonies. Still, what other purposes do they have? They can make some money just serving as radar stations and relays, making sure interstellar space is clear of dangerous debris or accurately marked off where not, and picking up and retransmitting signals, 
they could maybe charge a tax or tariff for passing through their space, which they keep clear and safe, and those three things might be more than enough to pay for information and entertainment from the inner solar system. They could sell some bulk raw materials, ammonia, nitrogen, and so on, particularly if starlifting never got going. Nitrogen is likely to always be in demand when you're building living space, people don't need it but plants do. Not much, but we do have one other option. I said interstellar starships don't slow down, so they don't need fuel and rest stops, but about a year ago we did an episode called Interstellar Highways, where we discussed how to do ships that travel far faster and more efficiently than even a fusion drive would permit by being pushed by powerful lasers. Lasers have range limits as they do expand, and what's more you can get more mileage out of them by bouncing a beam between places. You can see that episode for details, but the basic notion is to string out a long chain of beaming stations between two stars and use them to push a ship up to speed or reverse that, push back against them to slow them down. So these Oort colonies could serve that function, and since they are innately mobile, they can move themselves to be part of such a chain too one of millions of such stations spread over hundreds of such laser highways to all our neighboring systems, though still very isolated, no closer to their neighbors than Pluto is to us. Such systems, as discussed in that episode, allow travel between stars far faster and cheaper than not only fusion, but even systems like antimatter or black hole powered ships, which still suffer from the limitations of the rocket equation as they have to carry their own fuel. On the other hand, fuel can be moved down these highways quite cheaply, in tankers or even beamed, and since you can accelerate particles quite quickly, you could actually send raw material to or from the Oort station and a ship, just a particle beam carrying oxygen to a ship, or metals from a ship to a station needing them, or even fusion fuel from the station to a ship that would need it to slow down if it went past the highway's end or somehow drifted off it. And now suddenly these Oort Cloud colonies are not sparse poor villages in the distant reaches of space, but big truck stops or even fortresses, considering those giant pushing laser cannons are, well, giant laser cannons with a clear field of view over empty space light hours across. Needless to say, as many solar systems are colonized, it might be advantageous to have a ton of defense stations light months out from your system proper, if your interstellar neighbors aren't the friendliest bunch. So you've got signal relays, pushing lasers for interstellar ships, defense screens, and radars for hazards or debris or sneaky naval ships. Between all of those, you not only have the ability to make such Oort colonies, but a clear motivation to assist or subsidize making them. We don't have a great guess on mass total or distribution in the Oort cloud, but it's guessed there may be trillions of icy bodies a kilometer or more across and any one of those has more than enough water and organic critical materials for an entire O'Neill cylinder for a few hundred thousand people, and certainly more than enough for a decent sized community of a few thousand. Of course there are probably far more even smaller bodies sufficient for such smaller communities too. Any Oort Cloud civilization would be a very spread out thing, likely with at most loose alliances of neighboring ones if not totally independent, and utterly eclipsed by the far more massive civilizations that could exist in the inner solar system, but with trillions of such objects, each potentially supporting hundreds of thousands of people, you could easily have the Oort Cloud home to hundreds of quadrillions of people, small compared to a Dyson Swarm, but still more than a million times the Earth's current population, and huge compared to your typical fictional interstellar empire. Next week we will be heading out beyond the solar system to examine the concept of interstellar empires, where we'll be discussing the flaws in common assumptions on this topic and some realistic approaches. Our sponsor, Brilliant.org, has an excellent course, Worlds Beyond Earth, that explains concepts of interstellar travel, locating exoplanets, and how we determine which ones might be habitable. Worlds Beyond Earth is an excellent primer for that topic, and lets you transition from viewing interstellar colonization from a science fiction perspective to viewing it the way a physicist does. To support the channel and learn more about Brilliant, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. As a bonus, the first 200 subscribers will get 20% off the annual premium membership. After next week's Interstellar Empires, we will head out of the galaxy and out of 2017 to discuss intergalactic colonization. We will then return to the Outward Bound series at the beginning of the year, 
but rather than heading further out from Earth and the Solar System, we will visit the center of our Solar System to discuss colonizing the Sun itself. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.